Hi, everyone. Thanks for uh, attending. I uh, appreciate your time. Uh, I am uh, delighted that you're all here. Uh, this is important information, and hopefully you'll uh, benefit from our time together. So I want to welcome all of you on behalf of the Access to Integrative Medicine, Health Institute, and the GW Office of Integrative Medicine and Health. Uh, AIM is a nonprofit organization with the mission to provide access to whole person, whole person health and wellness in the greater Washington, D.C. area through integrative therapies, education, and research with a focus on vulnerable and low-income communities. Uh, please sign up for our mailing list at healthaim.org. Uh, follow us on Facebook or Instagram and kindly consider donations uh, to help us keep going and uh, keep this sort of care accessible for all people. Uh, the GW Office of uh, Integrative uh, Medicine and Health provides professional development, education, and community outreach to improve health and wellness. You can follow GW uh, Integrative Medicine on Twitter, Instagram, or LinkedIn, or sign up for a newsletter by visiting our website, smhsgwu.edu backslash OIMH. AIM and GW OIMH are very happy to offer these experiences for free and plan to keep doing so on Fridays at 2 p.m. Eastern. Uh, we look forward to continuing to be present with each of you every week. Um, so this is a real uh, pleasure and opportunity uh, for me to join this group and present a little bit of uh, new information that um, uh, I've been interested in, and that is trying to answer the question, are there any um, potential uh, valid treatments for uh, COVID virus um, in the acute situation meaning that the individual has contracted the infection? Um, so I'm going to review uh, a little bit of data that we have and talk about some research that I think we're about to perform. For those of you who don't know me, I'm the Medical Director of Integrative Medicine here at GW and also the Director of Academic Affairs at the Metabolic Medical Institute and the American Academy of Anti-Aging Medicine. So the states of health or disease are the expressions of the success or failure experienced by the organism in its efforts to respond adaptively to environmental challenges. I think this is a nice quote because certainly in our efforts in integrative medicine, we're always thinking we're always both sides of the coin. One is to say, um, with respect to the virus, do we have any antiviral therapies that are effective? But also asking the question, how do we improve the resiliency of the, um, the host itself? So by the numbers, uh, we know that COVID is a, a coronavirus. And it has elements of SARS, meaning that it induces a respiratory distress uh, picture in those that are the most compromised. We believe that it originated in bats um, and then was transferred to humans. That was the first uh, mutation event. Then it seems to be a second mutation event, at least, uh, to make the virus uh, more lethal for humans. While the first published case was uh, end of December in 2019 from Wuhan, Certainly, there have been reports of um, earlier identif and identified cases in uh, November and even maybe sooner than that. Uh, it seemed to be associated with a wholesale market called a wet market, uh, where animals are sold and uh, prepared for consumption. Uh, and in early January, China confirmed the uh, symptoms related to the initial infection and also began to identify the person-to-person -person transmission. Uh, by early March, it was, of course, diagnosed or labeled as a pandemic. Um, as of today, we have 1.6 million individuals infected globally. Uh, the U.S. has passed China and Italy uh, to have the most infected individuals uh, at the end of March. And today, our current death toll, unfortunately, is above 16,000. Um, I would also say that these are likely underreported numbers because not everybody who um, um, has perished from the illness is being counted, uh, mostly because test kits themselves are uh, precious commodities. Um, in addition to that, it seems that the um, overall death rate is around 3% or so, but it does seem to be dependent on the type of population in which the virus um, is um, operating. We know that one of the major consequences, of course, is the economic consequence beyond the health consequences, and now over 6 million Americans have claimed for unemployment insurance. And the question really becomes sort of where does this end, especially in the context of social distancing. Um, so the total deaths um, due to COVID by the end of March uh, were obviously significant. Um, at this time, the U.S. was just beginning to um, increase uh, our experience on the uh, early phase of the bell curve. 
The transmission is uh, likely respiratory in nature uh, through uh, coughing and sneezing, as well as in uh, close personal contact or touching surfaces where the virus might uh, be as well. There's also some suggestion that potentially even after the person has um, eliminated the infection per se, there could be a, a post uh, shedding experience of up to even a month through the fecal route. And um, so the question then becomes, how long do people have to worry about these issues even after they've been infected? The symptoms are relatively straightforward in terms of cough and fever, some digestive complaints. Uh, unfortunately, there seems to be some additional consequences beyond respiratory. Uh, there are reports of patients who um, end up in kidney failure um, and cardiogenic shock and the processes are not well known in that regard. So the symptoms early on can be mild, and it seems that um, who survives the illness, it, it's relatively individualized, but as we do risk stratification, it is older um, individuals or pre-existing health conditions. 80% um, of deaths were among adults 65 or older, and the highest percentage of severe outcomes occurring in people 85 years or older. Right now, we don't have great treatments. I know there's a lot of discussion in the media about uh, hydroxychloroquine combined with azithromycin and even zinc, uh, but none of the studies are really convincing at this point. A number of academic institutions are now not recommending these interventions because in the early phases of the infection uh, process, they didn't see any real benefit. Although, obviously, these treatments are still being tried. I think, you know, the jury is still out in terms of a larger study. With that being said, I, I do think that we have some other options that are at least interesting and we're drawing upon data from other populations, of course, because no one has ever studied um, uh, therapeutics in, uh, in the setting of a coronavirus infection. So uh, this is all uh, based on other lines of, of information. But interestingly, from our world in integrative medicine, many of you have probably heard of glutathione. Um, mostly as a powerful antioxidant in the body, but it turns out it's a very potent antiviral. In addition to that, when combined with a ring sugar called cyclodextrin, um, which also has been uh, studied as an antiviral, we now have a very interesting combination um, ingredient. In addition to that, it's easy to apply transdermally, um, and it's designed to prevent the progression of uh, the disease. So basically intervening on patients that have been diagnosed with COVID, uh, but if not yet, uh, met criteria for uh, ventilator. Both of these ingredients are known as GRAS or generally recognized as safe. This is an FDA distinction that essentially asserts that each of the uh, compounds um, can be classified as food additives and therefore have no known side effects or harm to humans. In the acute situation, what we've been doing is spraying uh, four sprays topically to the abdomen every four hours until symptoms resolve. We now have a case series of about 30 subjects uh, or patients that we've treated, and we're just collecting information on them, and none of them have progressed to acute respiratory distress. Obviously, that's not uh, enough data to say anything other than it's anecdotal, um, but we have been trying it in patients with some nice success. So what is glutathione? It's a tripeptide. It's present in all mammals, and it's really a precursor to glutamate, cysteine, and glycine. Um, it plays an important role in a variety of physiologic and metabolic processes. Its main role is an antioxidant. Um, it also helps to support cellular proliferation. Um, it is our most powerful intracellular antioxidant, and I would note the intracellular in particular, but it also, of course, directs detoxification, and that's where most integrative providers have focused, is its ability to help the liver um, dispose of toxic compounds. Um, it turns out that glutathione levels um, and their abnormalities have been observed in a wide range of pathologies, including cancer, neurodegenerative diseases, cystic fibrosis um, infections, as well as in aging in general. And there's been a lot of interest in how do we raise intracellular glutathione effectively um, as a mitigating factor against these disease processes. It turns out that there's a variety of uh, lines of research that also show glutathione in particular as a very potent antiviral, even though that's not something uh, we often think about, mostly because it's associated with changing the redox potential inside cells and reducing the oxidative stress. Most viruses in particular will induce oxidative stress as a proliferative event. They require some oxidative uh, free radicals uh, to pro proliferate themselves. So the viruses take over the machinery of the cell uh, to induce these oxidative stress expressions. Um, when you have alterations of those endogenous levels of glutathione, it's been found in experimental infections 
uh, with respect to herpes simplex, sendivirus, HIV, flu A, and HSV-1. It seems to be a common feature of many uh, viral processes. We also know that glutathione levels are decreased in plasma, um, as well as peripheral cells and monocytes in asymptomatic HIV patients, as well as in full-blown AIDS. In addition to that, we believe the mechanism of action of the antiviral effect is to block this oxidative stress activating uh, compound NF-kappa B, which is not only pro-oxidative, but pro-inflammatory, uh, which has been linked in particular to um, HIV replication. A similar mechanism has also been suggested for HSV-1. And in the case of influenza virus, uh, glutathione may inhibit apoptosis and subsequent release of um, the active virus from dead cells resulting from viral infection. So it actually plays a role uh, in changing cell metabolism to prevent spread of the virus too, which is a very interesting property. It also may interfere with entry of the virus into the cell itself, um, which is also very important because of uh, the way viruses have to um, get down to the nuclear envelope to take over the DNA machinery. Um, in addition to that, it's been widely demonstrated uh, to um, affect a, vari a variety of different viral processes. Um, and we've seen this in a relatively important dose-dependent manner. That's important for us as we've thought about the clinical application. Uh, it's been shown to be preventive against uh, flu infection in a mouse model. Uh, it's also been shown in high doses to prevent um, other viral infections that um, are DNA in particular, just like the coronavirus. And a more oxidized environment can favor viral infections uh, that with the administration of exogenous glutathione is a potentially useful strategy. The, the problem with glutathione though, despite its antiviral properties, is that it has a very hard time crossing the cell membrane. And you have to achieve very high tissue concentration levels uh, to make this occur. And though, so for this reason, uh, a lot of um, researchers have looked for carrier molecules or penetrating molecules as we call them to help glutathione get into the cell itself. And this is where cyclodextrins play a very important role. This is the second agent uh, that's been combined with uh, glutathione because it has uh, that very property that we need to drive intracellular levels of glutathione high. Now, what is a cyclodextrin? It's basically just a ring sugar. And there are different types of cyclodextrins. There's alpha, beta, gamma, delta, it turns out that most um, cyclodextrins are beta in the marketplace, uh, but there is gamma too, and gamma is about 10 times as potent as beta. There's a variety of commercial applications for cyclodextrins, not just in drug delivery, but as air fresheners and cosmetics and food. Um, it's demonstrated highly efficient virucidal broad spectrum activity in vitro and in vivo and in animal models. So there's a whole line of research looking at cyclodextrins not as a carrier molecule, not in the other commercial applications, but actually as an antiviral. Um, it's been shown to play a key role in the treatment and prevention of coronavirus itself in animals. Uh, infection by envelope viruses, including corona and uh, flu, is mediated by viral binding cellular receptors and fusion of the viral envelope with the host cell membrane. So basically what's happening is cyclodestrin, cyclodestrins, among other things, can help prevent the virus from entering the cell or really glomming on to the cell membrane. And we think this is occurring due to um, cholesterol that's present in microdomains in the viral envelope and the cell membrane, which are required for successful entry of the envelope virus into the host cell. Uh, cyclodextrins also sequester that cholesterol from vir viral particles, thereby causing lipid raft disruption and consequent structural deformation of the viral envelope. So what happens is viruses like to have cells glom together and cyclodextrins interfere with that process. So the virus has a harder time from getting from one cell to the next. Um, it depletes cholesterol from the host cell membranes, rendering them less susceptible to viral infections. That's partly how they work. And these lipid rafts, what we call ceramides essentially, have been shown to play a significant role in the early stages of severe respiratory uh, distress, like in the SARS process and in the coronavirus too. So what we have then is a very interesting uh, compound, which is a mixture of the glutathione and gamma cyclodextrin um, that we've been applying as a topical agent. And while we only have a case series, um, it's a provocative case series, and we're looking to go into a randomized controlled trial um, uh, is studying infected uh, individuals and tracking their outcomes. What we're looking to do is to prevent them from progressing to severe illness and or respiratory distress. We've been able to calculate that we need about 200 subjects to do this. Uh, we'll be tracking their fever and cough. Um, and um, there's only a limited uh, 
uh, grouping of exclusion criteria, uh, but we are we will be likely targeting people over age 60 uh, because those are the ones that are, that are at high risk for um, severe illness or uh, respiratory distress. Um, and I would say as an aside, uh, and this just came up, uh, we, we had treated a infectious disease physician um, in California who's a relatively highly placed person within the Kaiser Permanente system. And we have a meeting on Monday uh, to talk about uh, going into a large clinical trial with them. So we're discussing with their uh, clinical research group uh, how to deploy this in a study population. So there's a number of activities that we're looking at, not just with Kaiser, but in other um, groups as well, uh, to study this combination. But so far, we've had some early success, but it needs to be studied in a more rigorous way. So I, this, I, I wanted to take some time to talk about sort of what do we have to bring to the table from an integrated perspective that uh, our conventional colleagues might not be thinking about, especially when you're looking at lines of research that are relatively provocative, but also a very high safety profile, especially since both glutathione and cyclodextrin are grass status. So there's very little excuse risk me, of harm. Dr. Heyman? High reward. What's that? Uh, excuse me, we have a question. Um, what's the best thing to do at home right now? And what foods have uh, glutathione? Um, there are no foods that I'm aware of that would significantly raise glutathione levels. So I don't think that, you know, this is a nutritional strategy, at least in food. Um, but what you can do at home to raise glutathione intracellularly is to take N-acetylcysteine. N-acetylcysteine is the direct precursor to glutathione. Um, I would suggest 1,000 milligrams twice a day. Uh, there are some early research studies to show that individuals who either take NAC or have naturally high levels of glutathione are more resilient or resistant to infections such as the cold and flu. Um, so well, there are some yeah. things you can do to sort of modulate your immune system that is sort of a one-off from a product like this, which we're using obviously for acute, um, acute illness. Now, is this a supplement or? This is actually, this is an over-the-counter. Um, people can uh, purchase this. Believe it or not, it's actually sold as a skincare product, uh, but when used in higher dosing, it can um, have this potent antiviral property. Good to know. Hello, everyone. Um, just introduce myself quickly. Lee Frame. I'm the program director for integrative medicine at GW, um, and I'm also a nutritionist, so I just wanted to to handle that food question, I, I did type it into the chat box. There are some foods that can promote uh, more glutathione in your body, mostly cruciferous vegetables. So things like Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, things that are just really good for you. So I would recommend eating those as well. Um, but Dr. Heyman is correct. They won't be able to raise the levels that you would need to have this method. method yeah. But eat more of them, um, yeah. it's probably a good thing to do anyway. Yeah. 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 I think from a therapeutic perspective, you know, you really want very high uh, concentration levels because the virus quickly depletes glutathione. Um, so anything you, you can do in that regard uh, to boost those levels, I think would be uh, very helpful. So thanks so much for your attention. I now want to introduce Cynthia Powell. She's the director of the Office of Student um, and Professional Enrichment, and she's a clinical instructor at the GW School of Medicine and Health Science. Thank you, and hello everyone. I am also delighted to be here with you. And I just want to start by saying the COVID-19 pandemic has likely brought many changes to our lives, including daily, altered daily routines, uncertainty, and social isolation. And so during this time, it's not uncommon, certainly, to be experiencing stress, anxiety, fear, sadness, and loneliness. And therefore, it is a real importance of focusing on self-care strategies, including mind-body practices, and getting the care that we need to help us cope through this really challenging time. And research has shown that mind-body practices like meditation can help us to decrease stress-related symptoms, as well as improve quality of life. So for those of you who may be new to meditation and mindfulness, I just would like to go over a little terminology. So mind and body practices focus on the interactions among the brain, mind, body, and behavior. And examples of mind-body practices include meditation, 
hypnosis, guided imagery, yoga, and Tai Chi. Meditation, according to the National Institute of Health, is a mind and body practice that has a long history of use for increasing calmness and physical relaxation, improving psychological balance, coping with illness, and enhancing overall health and well being. Mindfulness, according to Dr. John Kabat Zinn, is the awareness that arises from paying attention on purpose in the present moment and non judgmentally. And scientists have discovered that mindfulness techniques help improve physical health in a number of ways. And those ways include helping to relieve stress, treat heart disease, lower blood pressure, reduce chronic pain, and improve sleep. So with all of that being said, I'm going to encourage you to get into a comfortable position, if you're not already. And in Excuse me, Cynthia, can you please speak louder? We all really want to hear you. Oh, sure. And I'm, I'm increasing the volume as well. Is that better? Thank you. Oh, of course. So again, I'm going to encourage you to get into a comfortable position. And in meditation, this can be sitting, standing, lying down. And you're going to want to feel relaxed, yet alert. And I'm going to encourage you to either close your eyes or lower your gaze. It feels more comfortable. And take a moment to focus on where you feel your breath in your body. Could be in your abdomen, your chest, throat, nostrils. Bring attention to the sensation of your breath. And by doing so, this is a way of bringing us into the present moment. So the mind, body, and breath are intimately connected and can influence each other. Our breathing is influenced by our thoughts, and our thoughts and physiology can be influenced by our breath. And this first meditation practice is called a hand on heart. And it's a practice that can help us respond skillfully to distressing events. It's something we can do quickly, several times a day if we would like, to bring calmness and awareness to our overall experiences. So I'm going to invite you to place a hand over your heart so that you feel the warm touch of your hand on your chest. And then begin to breathe more slowly, more gently, more deeply into your heart center. And I'm going to invite you to recall a moment when you felt safe, loved, and cherished by another human being. Not the entire relationship per se, just one moment. And this could be a moment with a spouse or significant other, a parent, a child, a friend, a coach, or a teacher. And let the warmth of this moment wash through your body as you remember. I'm going to take about 30 seconds just to savor this feeling. And when you're ready, I invite you to reflect on any shift that you may have felt in your body from this practice.
The second practice I'd like to share with you today is a compassionate body scan. And again, encouraging you to get into a comfortable position that could be sitting, standing, or lying down. Taking a few moments to settle and center yourself and taking three deep cleansing breaths. If you haven't already done so, I'm gonna encourage you to again, close your eyes or lower your gaze. Self-compassion yields a number of benefits, including lower levels of anxiety and depression. And the body scan meditation can promote stress awareness and relaxation. The aim in a body scan meditation is to become aware of different areas of the body and to tune into how each body part feels with curiosity and non-judgment, as well as cultivating an open, compassionate attitude. So I'm going to invite you to come into the present moment, letting go of regrets about the past or worries about the future. And we'll begin by bringing attention to the head, eyes, and jaw allowing any tension to soften. And just rest here for a few moments, taking it all in. If you notice pain or emotional discomfort, I encourage you to bring kind and loving attention to that part of your body. Now we'll move into the neck and throat, allowing them to soften, bringing soothing attention to any tightness or discomfort. And now we'll continue down in the shoulders and chest, filling your body with kindness. Notice any discomfort and invite it to soften. bringing a gentle and kind attention to any pain or emotion.
So if you feel yourself getting distracted during this practice, it's okay. It's pretty normal. Just return to the focus on your breath. And now I invite you to bring attention to both of your arms simultaneously, from the upper arms down to the fingertips. And if this is a difficult time for you, perhaps letting your hand rest on your chest, feeling this soothing and comforting touch. And we'll continue with the belly, back, and pelvis, bringing kind, compassionate attention to every part of your body. And if difficult feelings arise, either return to your breath or try repeating some phrases such as, may I be safe? May I be healthy? May I be peaceful? And may I live with ease.
And if you like, you can simplify the sequence to just the key words. Safe. Healthy. Peaceful. Ease. And let these words land, receive them. And now I invite you to bring kind attention to the thighs, knees, ankles, and feet. Appreciating all that your body does and how hard it works for you. And if you get distracted, perhaps different thoughts are coming into your mind, it is okay. You may just want to return to the phrases or the breath. And if you ever feel overwhelmed by a feeling associated with a particular area, you can bypass this part of your body and return to it when you're ready.
And as we're starting to come to the end of this practice, I want to invite you to take a moment to view your entire body with compassion and see if you can appreciate your body, accepting it as it is right now. And when you're ready, you may want to bring some movement into your body, perhaps stretch, rotate your wrists and your ankles. And when you're ready, gently opening your eyes. And now I'd like to return it to Jana. I don't know about everyone, but I am feeling a distinct lowering of my um, stress level right now. Thank you so much, Cynthia. My pleasure. Thank you so much, Andy. Um, but I have, before um, everyone leaves, I have a few housekeeping duties. We have a question for Dr. Heyman. And let me find that. What is the uh, glutathione dose you are using in the clinical trial? Um, is liposomal glutathione effective? Uh, so the, the dose is quite, can you hear me? Uh, you might want to get closer. Okay, hold on. Can you hear me now? <laughs> yes. Okay. So uh, the dose is 175 milligrams every four hours, uh, which is actually quite a bit. But don't forget, this is combined with something called gamma cyclodextrin. Uh, the amount of tissue level that we're able to achieve uh, with this particular formulation is is very high. I, it's not worth going into the the published details in that regard, but it's it's higher than liposomal. Um, so there are different um, delivery forms of glutathione. Liposomal is a phospholipid. You can um, attempt to take glutathione orally uh, in a liposomal form. Uh, there are some transdermal um, preparations as well in that regard. Um, I, but I think that the, um, the ability to uh, raise intracellular levels is still sort of the holy grail. Uh, this, is, this one is one of the few products that seems to do it uh, reliably, but certainly any form of glutathione that you have access to is better than nothing. Um, and so if you do have um, a liposomal glutathione, um, you know, there's certainly no harm in taking glutathione. And I would just follow the instructions on, on you know, what your particular product uh, recommends as a traditional dose. Um, but this is a very, very high dose, um, but, but really only reserved for individuals that are infected because don't, don't forget when you are infected, 
the virus is specifically depleting glutathione levels, which in many ways is what leads to the pathophysiology of the, of the disease. 